Oh, that's funny to you? Of course not. You really don't remember what you did to me? You beat me into this! Look at me! Excuse me, do you have uh, an ATM machine? Yeah, our own here in the box. Preferably not chained to the wall? Uh, nothing. This should be simple enough. I think that spot is a really good metaphor. We don't really know or can't really tell what kind of traumas and hurts someone else is going through because they don't wear it on top of their skin. We don't see them. Our traumas or hurts are often neglected or invisible to other people. I am the spot. We meet again, <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> oh, that's funny to you? Of course not. No. And that's the problem with all of our wounds and triggers. If someone has a gash on their arm or a broken arm or a broken leg, we would know to be careful with that. We would probably, unless we're horrible people, try to avoid hurting that or rubbing up against it. But because other people's wounds or hurts are invisible to us, we often will say stuff and we don't even understand someone else's reaction of why they're so upset or bothered by that. And so the first thing that you want to know is that if you say something and someone else reacts exceptionally badly, that's the first sign that you have probably rubbed up against something that hurt them before. It could be something completely innocuous to you. Maybe a parental figure or a bully or one of their siblings used to tease them about. So is that a costume? Unfortunately for both of us, this is skin. Oh, dang. And we often think that when someone reacts poorly, it's actually about us. But in most interactions, it's usually about their own personal journey. We need to be a little bit more sensitive to when someone reacts poorly and we've hurt someone to be able to acknowledge and validate that because that's what most of us hope and want. Just to have someone see us, truly see us for who we are. I'm from your past. One year ago. Hold up. Miles, because of his age, doesn't really know how to be able to properly validate. And let's be honest, it's not taught in schools. These are things that should be taught in schools because how do we deal with personal interaction when most of our world is about personally interacting with other people? And we're not really taught what are the things that make other people feel good and affirmed and listened to. Oh, come on. Uh-oh. Well, this has been Who fun. are you talking um, to? But I really gotta wrap this are up. Are you gonna be a while? Because I can't... I love how spot, which yes, could be a metaphor of wearing your hurt on the outside instead of on the inside, but I love how spot uses humor and spot at the beginning seems really harmless and sweet and Miles doesn't really take him as seriously as what he hopes for. A lot of times we use humor as a way to diffuse pain when we're actually hurting on the inside. And I think that a lot of us also deal with using humor in order to avoid stressful situations. Sometimes humor, something that we say, we're trying to diffuse a situation, but underneath we might feel really hurt, upset, angry, or stressed. Out of all of the different techniques to be able to diffuse anger or stress, humor can be exceptionally effective also. But you wanna be careful because sometimes people use humor instead to hurt people and like a weapon. And when you hope to be taken seriously, but instead you're laughed at, that can actually add more to that wound. You're looking at your text? You understand this is the fight of our lives, right? Sorry, sorry, just, okay. just a second. Again, this kind of insult to injury. He's trying to say that, like, look at me, I'm this big bad guy. Like, but it, it actually reminds me a lot of childhood and a lot of trauma that people have gone through when you want your parental figure to be able to spend some time with you, but instead they're on their computer or reading a magazine or a newspaper or on their phone. It's caused a lot of people trauma and hurt. And I think that that kind of feeling of disrespect when you feel like someone should take you seriously can really grate upon someone where they want payback, they want retribution. And I think that for a lot of people that have been bullied or maligned or made fun of or mocked, that that's their trauma and that's that revenge fantasy that they have that one day you'll regret not taking me seriously. No, 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 go ahead, take the call. Turn off your phone in a one movie second. theater. You don't turn it off when you're fighting me? Like, do you hear that line? Like, it comes off as this really funny joke. You would turn off your phone in a movie theater, but you won't turn it off for fighting me. So I mean so little to you, you think, you respect me so little that even the concessions that you would make in a theater while you're watching a movie, you're not gonna do while you're fighting me. That the battle with me is so meaningless that you can text while you fight me. I can feel it, like I feel for Spot, I feel that sense of hurt that 
he matters that little. His threat is that minute. This is fun. Oh, oh, PTA. He left in the middle of a fight. I did not. It was, Are you serious? It was inconsiderate and super rude and a little cocky. Spot shares what he wants from someone else. Like he's specifically saying to Miles what he hopes to get from him, which is kind of interesting to have because if we're juxtapositioning that he's supposed to be the bad guy or the antithesis to Miles, then you're probably not going to expect that, you know, someone else is going to share what I hope to have this relationship be like. So in a way, even though they've just met each other, they're going through these negotiations of how I hope this relationship would be, which would be the same thing that would happen in any other relationship, a couple, a familial relationship, the colleagues that you work for. When you hope for something from someone, specifically ask for it. A lot of people say to me, well, but they should just know. But we don't, we don't know. So if someone is already not doing it, they probably don't know or don't realize that they're doing it. And so the best way to handle the situation is to let someone know what you expect from them and then hope that they can listen. But know that it takes a little bit of time for behaviors to change. So please allocate for that as well. Destiny brought us here. You see now, don't you? I really don't. You really don't remember what you did to me? Which is common. Like a lot of times when something bad happened to us, when we've been bullied or slighted or maligned, we make it this huge monumental thing to us. Possibly for that other person, it was a nothing. They might not have even been paying attention. They might have been wrapped in their own story. They might have been going through their own trauma and so didn't even notice that they did it. For one person, this might have been the most painful experience in their entire life. That trauma and hurt kind of happens again when the other person doesn't even know or recognize it, doesn't even remember that it happened. You're living this story over and over in your head, reliving the trauma, which if you relive it over and over in your head without doing it therapeutically, you can actually make that feeling worse and worse and it kind of grows like a real malignancy inside of you, which I think is a really interesting metaphor for Spot who kind of wears all of these malignancies on him, not just in him. I worked at Alchemax that brought a spider here from another dimension and it bit you. My spider made you Spider-Man. You can see that the way that Spot sees things is that he should be more important to Miles because Everything that Miles has now, he sees himself as giving it to him, that he created Spider-Man. And so should get a little bit more thought and a little bit more respect. And that's what he's hoping for. That's that bucket that he's hoping to fill. We all are kind of carrying around these buckets that if you're paying attention to what someone's saying, they're saying, please fill this bucket right here. But we're often just so wrapped in our own mind, and especially for Miles, all the things that are happening, that we don't even notice it when someone is asking for us for some attention or some time or some validation. Some of them could be be valid. Some of them could say, I'm a good enough person. Some of them could say, fill my self-esteem, love me, pay attention. The question that you want to ask yourself is not what they're saying, but why are they saying it? What are they hoping for? Because whatever we share with someone, we are hoping to get a certain response from them. Usually it's not that big of a cost to us to be able to give that to other people. I think that that's a kindness to be able to see people and to be able to recognize what are their hopes and what are their needs and try not to step on their wounds. Sometimes these buckets don't even have ends to them. Like we, we have to stitch these buckets ourselves. In the end, it's us that has to fill these buckets, not other people. And so they get filled for a period of time, but they end up empty again. And I think that it's very true. We often don't know what are the buckets that we each carry. We all carry them. So because we don't know them, sometimes we're saying something, we're like, I don't even know why I said that or why I did that. But probably it's because of either a wound or a trigger or a bucket that we are hoping to get filled. So you should spend some time of introspection and be able to ask yourself, what buckets do I have? What makes me feel good and happy? That's how you know that you're getting that filled. What? You ran through the cafeteria. You hit me with a bagel. Ah! <laughs> it's the insult to injury, right? Like those moments where someone did something that made us feel small or mocked or laughed at. Is that enough to 
create this kind of anger inside of people. Well, if you've ever been bullied or made fun of in a way that is public, especially if it's social anxiety where that's the last thing that you want, yes, you can understand how someone would have that want to get things back, to be able to make things right, to make someone respect you. Now, of course, doing this is not the way to actually get that respect. That respect has to come within yourself. And often if someone is thoughtless, they're not going to suddenly be thoughtful and be able to give that to you either. It's the gift that we hope someone else will fill, but it's the gift that we need to give to ourselves. Hit a lot of different villains with a lot of different food. Make your flippy little sassy jokes. No one knows what it feels like to be on the other side of them. And that's so true. True. Like, yeah, you're right. To be mocked by someone else, especially if perhaps you've been mocked the entire time. So even this, he's telling Miles, this traumatized me. And I think that when someone else is telling us that we accusing us of something that we've done that's wronged them, trying to diminish it and kind of laugh it off is a way of us diffusing the situation, saying I'm not this bad person that's done this. It's much more thoughtful and responsible to be able to recognize that I might have done this and to give them some time and some space to be able to share how they feel and listen to them. And when you listen to someone, you want to actually authentically listen, not just kind of push them away and try to get through it as quickly as possible. When we're confronted with hurting others, it often also hurts us. And so it's a hard thing to be able to carry and deal with. Because of you, I lost my jobs, my life, my face, my family won't even look at me everyone laughing at him. He's lost all of the sense of identity of who he was, where he was a respected scientist, part of a group, and then he became this anomaly that no one even respected. And it could be that this is the way that he sees things. I doubt that all of the other scientists just stared at him and actually laughed at him. So sometimes also the way that we interpret things are different than what actually happened. Therapeutically, it doesn't really matter. We need to deal with your feelings on how you perceive the world. It is beneficial to be able to recognize that we warp reality around our own hurts and fears. And so often the way that we realize things, like we think that when we tripped, everyone was staring at us and everyone was laughing, but rarely is that the case. You meet me in the this, look at me. Get this to me. He's talking also about equity. He did something to Miles which made him a hero and Miles did something to him that made him maligned and mocked. You can feel that inner rage of how this isn't an equitable situation and he wants retribution. He wants to make this even. Unfortunately, usually especially in cases like this, there is no retribution. He can't get his life back. Often we're hunting, wanting, seeking for from someone else, something that even in the best case scenario, they can't fix. These are the kind of things that the more that you replay this story inside of your head, the more those neural processors become kind of super powered. The more the neurons fire together, the more they wire together, and this hurt becomes this super highway and grows and grows inside of you. Usually the pendulum can swing either way. If you have inside of you the possibility to do horrible things, you probably also have the possibility to do wonderful, amazing things. It's that dedication and that ability to follow through with things to deal with suffering. So yes, he definitely had a choice. He could have been the spot, a hero, and to be able to make people's lives better, to make a difference. But he's swallowed up by his own anger and that grows in him and he wants something back from someone that he may never get. So you end up chasing something that often even when you get it, doesn't really heal the wound, but we believe that it will. And so we keep on chasing it. And that's what he really wants, to be respected by Miles, to be respected by others. He wants him to respect him and doesn't care if he has to use fear in order to do that. That's what he's hoping for. So yes, he's going to feed off of that, but it's a feeding that will probably never be enough and to see the cost and the things that he has lost. And when we're hurt, that goes a long way to healing. What? I think I kicked myself 
into myself. I'm going to put my head in that hole. And this is probably something that only I see in this scene, but it seems very similar as a metaphor for therapy, that we try to go into ourself and look at all of the different hurts and kind of peer through them and sift through the ones that actually matter versus the ones that don't, and hopefully be able to go in there and fix them and settle them. A lot of techniques that you can use are kind of superficial. They're like band-aids, but some hurts are so deep within us that we need to kind of go in to find out what is actually the inception that caused it. I see therapy a lot the way that Spot sees going into himself and searching through all these holes to see what happens to be there. And sometimes when you find out what caused the reason that you feel this pain, just finding out that and realizing that can dissipate that feeling and lessen it and allow it to actually heal. And true healing, not just this band-aid effect that I'm doing something to avoid it. That doesn't work. Spot trying to make Miles pay isn't actually gonna solve the problem because the problem is inside of him. You got me agreeing with the bad guy right now. Bad guy? He's barely a villain of the week. What'd you call me? You realize I'm right Come here. On, man. Being called as not even a villain of the week that he matters that little and he lets them know that they then start talking about him which is another thing that's so diminutive when people talk about you as if you're not there sometimes we don't mind it if it's complimentary but especially if it's kind of we matter so little it's something that happens to children and people that are low on the totem pole or that we don't respect and that not being respected is what dr jonathan own already has a wound for. Wait, Spot, you need to stop what you're doing, man. I'm about to be so much more than a villain of the week. You see, that one little tiny comment that Miles made, it hurt him, he remembers it. So sometimes something that you say to someone might play over in their head over and over and over again. You might not even remember that you said it, but it was significant to them. And so if someone comes up to you and says, it really hurt me when you said this, try not to just be like, I don't remember, but say like, what did I say? I don't remember why I said it, I shouldn't have said it, and give a very authentic apology because it's really painful, especially if it already sits, like usually when someone says something that bothers you, it's because it already hits upon a belief system or a fear that you already possess inside of you. Probably the reason why he became a scientist in the first place was so that he could make a difference, so that people would care about him, respect him, and to be able to make his own spot on the world. I did it. I don't even feel bad. I'm sorry I called you that, okay? You're a great villain. Well, not yet, I'm not. See, but it's too late now, right? Like, it's too late. The only reason, like, he knows that the only reason that Miles actually cares is because now Miles actually is scared and worried what he's about to do. Sometimes we're just so angry that we're lost in that. We have that path and nothing's gonna stop us, especially if we lean towards being more single-minded. Some people are exceptionally driven and once they have something set in effect, they create this archetype and nothing's gonna stop them from the drive, even if they should stop. It's that feeling of sunk cost fallacy. I've already invested too much in this to be able to stop now. You'll finally have a villain worth fighting and I won't be just a joke to you. And if he was in my office, I would ask Spot specifically, why do you care what Miles thinks? Why do you need his validation? And we would go through the reasons that he feels so hurt by him, but also, so he validates you. Does that suddenly make all of the hurt go away? For some of us, yes, but usually it's because that inner negative self-talk is already saying these things. It's already linked. If someone says to you and you have dark black hair and someone says to you, I hate your blonde hair, it's not gonna matter anything because you don't have that color of hair so it doesn't stick but if you fear that you're stupid and someone mocks you or laughs at you when you make a mistake that would hurt much more because it already presses upon a wound that you have inside of you even if miles did suddenly respect him as he seems to be now much more fearful of him it doesn't actually fix it because that's not the thing that he really needs to fix. No, fear isn't respect. It's completely different. Respect is something that you earn. But for Dr. Jonathan Owen, he doesn't care. He's at the state now that he will take anything because he's becoming consumed by his own hurt and aggression. That feeling of constantly being stepped on and thought of as less. And so he's gonna take that in any way, shape, or form. Miles is just a placeholder for that hurt of something that he has to fix, but he's carrying it on the outside, whereas for Spot, it's actually on the inside. The Spot. He needs some respect. I'm gonna take everything from you like you took everything from me. His voice really changes now. That I find much more frightening. It's so much more calm. He's reached 
fruition, this point where he's all consumed by this power. And it goes to that Spider-Man line of, with great power comes great responsibility, but you can wield that responsibility for good or for ill. What? See you back home, Spider-Man. There's so much on Spotlight. There's so many great scenes. He's so many wonderful lines, so many funny lines, so many quips. Like, I think the character is really brilliant. I think it's also brilliant the way that he starts off benign and then ends up this really scary, malignant bad guy. And I think that that transition, even though it's quite quick in the story, we don't see him that often, it's still relatable and believable. You can feel the buildup. And I think that that's what makes a really good bad guy is when we can understand the progress and the progression of how he goes from someone that's really, really sweet to someone that's exceptionally scary. I found the spot terrifying. The end, that coldness in his voice, that it was deep, the way that the music was distorted just like his mind was, you believed that he meant everything that he said. These are my feelings on Dr. Jonathan Own, the spot. You can let me know what your thoughts are and if you found him as terrifying in the end from sweet and cute and quirky to truly scary and malignant. You can let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. And if you want to help out this channel or me, we're trying to get to 200,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So if you could hit that subscribe button, I would dearly appreciate it. Thank you.